Um, my dreams have always been to get on a, onto a fire department. Um, like I said, I landed my dream job in a freak accident. I do not know you, but I am your brother. You do not know me, but I am your protector. I will run into a burning building to save your life. Though I do not know your name, I will take a bullet for you. Though we've never met, I, I believe, believe in, in duty, duty and sacrifice, sacrifice of self. Of self. Your, your family, family is my family. Is my family. Your life is my duty. What's going on guys? Time for another episode of Behind the Uniforms. Very excited to have this gentleman who drove all the way out a couple hours from Massachusetts to join us. For those of you who have never seen this series before, the way that it works is this. We invite active, retired, doesn't matter, veterans, first responders onto the show. They tell us about a good day, tell us about a bad day. It's our way of showcasing and humanizing the men and women behind the uniforms. At all times here at the Whiskey Wall, we leave a glass and a bottle at an empty seat in honor of those who will unfortunately never be able to join us here. So without further ado, Tomo, who you are? Well, my name is Tom Stevens. I'm a paramedic. I currently work at Brewster Ambulance. Uh, I was recently uh, had to let go of uh, a position at East Bridgewater Fire uh, due to an unfortunate off-the-job accident. Uh, they couldn't uh, hold my position for too long after being injured and uh, only being on for such a short time. Finally land my dream job and a freak accident takes it away. Um, I actually wound up getting a nail in my neck oh. and it uh, went too far in. During the removal process, it went into a vein traveling down to my right ventricle. They, uh, they actually had to perform open heart surgery um, on an emergency basis just to get it out uh, safely. Jeez. Uh, yeah, they were, they um, had considered going in, but where the object was sharp enough to penetrate and travel, they were concerned that it would go further and cause further damage. Um, you know, a husband and father of two, so I couldn't take the risk. It was either take the risk and risk, you know, me passing, and my family losing out on all, you know, on me being there for them, or um, you know, risk losing my dream job and the ability to work doing a field that I very much enjoy. You know, I'll take my family every time. Of course, uh, of course. You know, my wife stood behind me, and she still does. Um, she's been very supportive through the entire process from start to finish. You know, and she was very worried about, you know, the potential outcome. Um, behind you know. every good man is a better woman. <laughs> <laughs> and she is definitely my better half. Uh, there's no doubt about it. She's made me a better person since the day I met her. Uh, uh, her entire family has been very welcoming and very supportive of everything that I've ever done. Um, you know, I started out going for the um, EMS direction. You know, my parents started me out, th you know, encouraging that. And then I had a teacher in high school, uh, Miss Miss Davis. Uh, she was very encouraging. She actually wrote me a note and uh, left it for me when I uh, when I graduated. Um, encouraging me to go there and pursue EMS and when I told her that's what I was going to do she that's when she decided to write the note and she left it for me and it was also very encouraging and I completed uh, EMT school uh, at the age of 17 so right out of high school I went right into it because um, it was a field that I knew that I'd be interested in uh, all of her classes were medical related. She had anatomy and physiology and biology, so she saw my clear interest in those and pretty much nothing else, because those are the classes that I would pay the most attention to, and sure. she saw that. Um, you know, and then going through the normal stages of EMS, you go to EMT school, and then you go to paramedic school. Paramedic school is actually where I met my wife, um, and I met her in the hospital. Um, you know, she was my friend. She was helping me study. She was also very encouraging of where I was going. She introduced me to her family, who was also very encouraging. You know, they they supported the fact that you know I wanted to be in such a profession that they considered a, a very noble profession as well. My dreams have always been to get on a, onto a fire department. Um, like I said, I landed my dream job and a freak accident. <laughs> 
Here's what's always been so fascinating to me about so many first responders, whether they're firefighters, they're Marines, they're police officers. When, when one thing is taken away from you and one ability to serve is taken away from you, so often you find another way of serving. And I think that that's incredibly admirable because you and your wife are, are both so dedicated to such a selfless profession, such an under-thanked profession. And that's obviously one of the reasons that we do this show is to say thank you. Um, so tell me, about, tell me about a good day. Um, well, a uh, good day for us is pretty much uh, no calls. <laughs> when sure. nothing comes in, everybody's having a good day. People don't normally call you when they're, not feeling, you know, when they're feeling 100%. They call us when they're having their worst day. You know, or they need somebody to come and hold their hand in the middle of the night. You know, how many times, I can't tell you that uh, you know, an elderly person just calls because they just don't want to be in a nursing home anymore. They just want to get out. They want to get away. Oh. I'm okay with that. I'll go. I'll show up. I'll slide you over to my cot. I'll take you to the hospital, and I'll shoot the breeze with you on the way there. Tell me about your life. It's awesome. You'd be amazed at some of the stories you'll hear just asking somebody to tell you about their life, which I'm sure, uh, as I've you know watched the series, a lot of people have uh, told you some very interesting things about their lives. Very. Uh, a few of them very inspiring. Um, you know, it's what got me to you know send you the email back and you know come down do the show. I saw that you were legit. There was nothing that I didn't like about the series you were producing. Thanks, brother. I appreciate that. <laughs> so want to tell me about a bad day? Um, well, I've done a lot of bad calls, um, but one of the worst things for me was uh, one of the worst call, phone calls I've ever gotten was uh, this August, um, right, out, you know, right around my uh, anniversary of becoming a paramedic. My, uh, one of my former partners uh, took his own life. Oh, man. Um, you know, and since then, I, you know, even before then, I've, I've wanted, you know, the ability or people just to, you know, I tell everybody, just call me if, you, if you're feeling like that. Call me if you're not feeling well. You know, for him, it just got to that point. You know, he, he too had been let go from a fire department after just getting on, and that was his dream. It's what he wanted to do. Um, you know, my partner, Scott, he was a great guy. There was a lot of people in the Northeast that'll tell you all about him. He worked for a lot of different companies and different roles, but he was a very, he, he, would, he would tell you the same thing. He was type A and retentive. Not everybody likes that, but I did. And the reason I liked it, because he took me from a paramedic that thought I knew everything and challenged me. And it was actually him and a fellow paramedic that, you know, I, I actually worked with a lot too that showed me on one particular call that I'm not right every time. Um, and in this instance, he actually, you know, he called me out on it. I didn't appreciate it at the time, but later on I did. Sure. You know, that was one of those things where, you know, I went to a fellow paramedic and said, what could I have done better? And he goes, so you could have listened to the senior medic. And after that, I kind of took that to heart and I, and I worked with that. Later on, I wound up working with this gentleman for three years. Um, in a 911 system where I depended on him, he depended on me, and that's how that worked. You know, we depended on the whole system, the police officers, the firefighters that showed up. You know, I depended on him, you know, in the middle of the night to remind me. He depended on me in the middle of the night to remind him. And because he challenged me, I felt like I did improve as a paramedic um, and as a person, you know, to appreciate positive and sometimes even negative feedback. Um, you know, one, you know, one of the worst things that's happened to me, as I said before, I had this dream job that a freak accident now took away. Thank God I got my wife. I mean, without her and my family being so encouraging, you know, my kids, I tell them don't quit. Um, never quit. If there's something that you want, you dream it, you go get it. It's not going to come to you. You have to go out and you have to work for it. You know, I, I at one point gained a little weight, so when I got news that I was um, 
that the department was interested in having me. I went and uh, actually started going to a, um, a Krav Maga studio. It's uh, Boston awesome. Taekwondo in Randolph. They also have been very encouraging, very, uh, very open, uh, very high energy, which took me a little getting used to, but it was a lot of fun learning everything. I can't help noticing your tattoo. Uh, I got this for a, another um, EMT that had uh, passed away. Uh, it says, so others may live. That's awesome. And I promised myself I'd never get one of these Stars of Life tattooed on my skin, but when he passed away, I wanted something that would honor him. Um, his name was John Wall. He was one of those, um, you know, he was a dispatcher. He was an EMT before that, supervisor. But he was one of those supervisors that at the end of a bad day, when you worked yourself to the bone, when the calls wouldn't <clears> stop <throat> coming in, when you had no choice but to do that one more because there was nobody else to do it. It's not like we can say no to an emergency. Um, he wouldn't let you leave until you were laughing. <laughs> and that was him. He was one of those guys. He was just way too funny. <laughs> let me ask you this. What do you, what do you hope people take away from not just your story but all of these stories? People who may not know what it's like, who may not ever live a day in your shoes. What, what do we want them to take as a message? For the, for the normal person, it's, you know, if you see, you know, you see EMS, police, fire, you know, especially with the negativity going on with the police department lately, these guys have families. These guys, have, you know, these men and women, they, they have people they go home to. The fire department has men and women, you know, that have families and they go home to, even if they're not married and, you know, or they, they may not have somebody at home, they're still people. Right. Still have parents and brothers and sisters and friends. Yep. And even without all that, we're still people. I mean, we still have feelings. We still eat, sleep, uh, do, other do taxes, things. you know, we, we do the same things everybody else does. Except when you call in the middle of the night, we're the people that show up. You never call us on your good day. Right. And we will show up for you every time at your worst moment because you call. For the men and women that are in this field, that they're not alone. You know, that there's somebody that's going to be on the other end of the line all you got to do is make that phone call. If you're feeling down, you're feeling like you're alone, make a phone call. Call a friend. Call somebody that cares about you. You know, nobody should have to get the same phone call that I got. You know, my friend's mother, she's going through it day by day. She's working on it the best she can. You know, she is, um, you know, she called me at first, and I, you know, before we stopped working together, you know, he had told me that if, you know, anything had ever happened, he would do his best to help me with my family. I made him the same promise. You know, I knew his mother, you know, if he wasn't there that, you know, if she ever needed anything, I told her she can call. And I'm keeping that promise. You know, I've maintained contact with her the entire time. And done my best to try to help her out in any way that I can. You know, we're working on a series right now about post-traumatic stress among correctional officers because we, we finally in society, in American society, have started to identify the impact of, post, of post-traumatic stress among veterans. But what we're not having a lot of conversations about is the impact of post-traumatic stress among everybody else who is a first responder. It's not just, you know, you're going down that road in Iraq and an IED goes off and it, that is a terrible, terrible experience. But in this field, it's more of a cumulative thing than it is one or two or three horrible, horrible incidents. And so I think now that society's starting to pay a little bit more attention to that, it's important that we all take a moment to recognize and that, you know, a good day for you is somebody not dying. A good day, a really good day may be a, a baby delivery, or but a good day for you is saving a life. 
And it's really important, I think, for us to all keep that in mind. But, brother, I appreciate you coming on the episode. So to you, to all of our first responders and veterans, cheers. Guys, thank you all so much for taking the two seconds it's going to take to hit the damn share button on this video. Literally two seconds. We don't ever ask you for anything. No money. Well, uh, bourbon's nice, but uh, just hit that share button. So thank you all so much. God bless, man. God bless America.